All right, purple. Let's record over here as well, just so we have some backup. All right, so we're doing MedSurge Bootcamp. So this is for people going to MedSurge 1, going into MedSurge 2, MedSurge 3. This should help you, all right, to get uh, acclimated to the MedSurge Nursing School uh, cacophony, that's a good word, of, uh, of, how, of how the nursing program operates and how uh, you can kind of organize your life and what life will you have, just nursing school, unfortunately. All right, so it's all, all going to be about, you have to plan your days out, you have to plan your, your week out, you, know, you have to find the exam day, because that's going to be your, your target day. You have to, can't be putting together study tools, putting together things and not knowing things the night before the exam. Ideally, you want to get all that stuff kind of uh, squared away ahead of time as much as possible. All right, so Medsridge Bootcamp. <clears throat> so time management. So a few things you want to look at are developing study tools. So study tools being a concept map, a, uh, a table, a, uh, you know, rewriting your notes, re-listening to things, uh, you know, doing things that would get you prepared for, to get the content into a, something that makes sense to you, right? You don't want the materials to go into your eyes and, and leave your eyes and leave your brain. You want to actually be using as many senses as possible, okay? What works best for me are tables. Concept maps are kind of tables just on one concept per page. Tables kind of put all the material into like one or two pages of material per concept, which is a little, little more manageable than 30 slides, right? You're like, well, 30 slides, I got so much information. But if I have all that information just on one or two pages, it might make a little more sense, right? So you want to be doing developing study tools and you want to be developing a uh, active learning strategy. So what is active learning? Is active learning reading your notes? No, that's just putting the, the information one direction, going from your from the from the paper to your eyeballs, maybe to your hey, your to your uh, your, your uh, to parietal lobe, over to maybe to one little area, a little association area, and that's it, right? It's just going in, right? Now, how much of that is actually being retained in your amygdala or your hippocampus? Not much, right? You have to work that muscle. Like, well, but the brain's not a muscle. That doesn't have a laser, does it? No. Okay, good. All right. So, anyways, active learning. So you want to be able to you want to stop creating study tools at this point. You want to be actively learning. This means that you are recalling information. You are taking the information and manipulating it in some fashion. All right. So this can be achieved with study groups, uh, study partners, uh, study sessions. Ideally, you want to indicate that less than four people. Right. You don't want to have a, a study party. You want to have a study session or study group. Right. And the whole purpose of these is to teach and manipulate the information, right? Not just read the notes to each other or read in-class questions together or read things together or watch videos together. That's what you had done ahead of time, right? The goal of this is to manipulate, take the information that you've created, right, with your study tools and start, you know, interacting and discussing things. Like, hey, do you realize that this is the only valve that, that gets worse when there's more blood, it gets le with less blood, right? Or this is the only th valve, this is the only uh, EKG that has this uh, treatment, right? This is a ventricular rhythm and it only, ha it only responds to this medication or this is, this, this, uh, when this has no pulse, I do this, right? When this CHF patient has uh, these symptoms, I have to call 911, all right? And you guys go, go back and forth and you try to quiz each other, you try to actively learn the material, all right? And in class questions on your own, because you can't always be attached to someone, you know, 24-7. So in class questions will start giving information and trying to manipulate the information in a way that will draw it all out and allow you to make connections as well. Okay? So these are things you want to look at. And again, the exam day is going to be your, your, uh, your, what's the word? Your timeline. That's the end of your timeline to where you're going to be able to say, well, shoot, I need to have this many study sessions. I need to have this many in-class questions done. I need to have created all my stuff ahead of time. So I'll give you some examples of what may or may not work for you, but you want to try to kind of in the ballpark get this, uh, this kind of strategy in place. These are examples of concept maps here. We have one little idea. So this is Alzheimer's, I believe, right? So these are medications. These are the treatments. These are the nursing interventions I do. These are the causes. These are the diagnostic tests, symptoms, so it's all on one page. You know, that, that can work for somebody. What works best for me, again, was putting things in table format. and works for other students as well. All right, so we want to manipulate all this information, and we want to be able to try to teach it, because when you teach it, that's what you're going to be able to make that all the information, that immense amount of information, be come to, you know, be focused and allow you to identify 
uh, similarities and differences, right? And just a, a hack is we only test you on differences, right? The only time we test you on similarities is uh, really on SATA questions, but really we want you to know what the differences are and what the life-threatening things are, right? That's how we can, you know that something is, is important, right? And also when you teach things, you are going to learn a lot more. When I teach things in the lecture, I learn like five or six things at the end of the day, all right? So, oh shoot, I just made that connection. I made that connection too. So you're always learning and you're always, when you're teaching, you're going to learn even more. All right, so as an example study plan, this is for August. A lot of you are graduating in May and this will make sense to you, but uh, this is a way to kind of plan your day. It still makes sense, like we have lecture on Monday right here, right? And there's a lecture that we might have that we're going to have for 103. We're going to have talk about lines and EKGs on Monday. So we want after that lecture, what do we want to do? Immediately after lecture, you're going to kind of close all your notes, right? Close all your notes and try to recall the information. Right? Again, you don't want just information is going from the, the lecturer's mouth or or your notes to your to your brain. You want to be able to uh, manipulate that information. You want to be able to create study tools. You want to be able to uh, develop that information and manipulate it. I keep saying the word manipulate. Anybody have a counter on manipulate? Anyways, so anyways, we have to, after lecture, you want to kind of close your notes. You want to kind of discuss what happened. Or if you have a study group, you guys can get together and say, what did we talk about? That way you're actively recalling. You go to a whiteboard, you write down, okay, we talked about lines. What are the lines? And you try to write down the lines and you realize, oh shoot, I forgot all about porticaths. What the heck, right? And next time, are you going to forget what you didn't forget what you forgot? Probably not, right? You're not going to you're going to remember the things you forget. So you want to try to disremember things as much as possible. And that's going to happen when you do study groups. It's going to happen when you do in-class questions. You do in-class questions like, oh shoot, I forgot porticath is also a central line, right? So any, all these different ways are ways to get, uh, to make the information stick, okay? And again, in-class questions. You want to be doing in-class questions here in pink. You want to be doing that the whole time, right? All the way up to, uh, sorry, up to the exam there. All right, you want to be doing English questions every day. English questions are going to be able to take the information that you have to know and be able to fine tune it as much as possible. All right, finding the best English questions can be can be can be hard. You don't want to, you want to have find English questions that give you good rationales, ones that will tell you the right answer, uh, of course, but also tell you the rationale for the wrong answers. Right, because on the on the test it could be one of those answers, those wrong answers. You just change one little word in the wrong answer that says tachycardia or it says bradycardia, right? Which one was the right one? Well, it was wrong when it said bradycardia, but it would be right if it said tachycardia. So you want to be able to identify which ones were correct. And we'll, we have some sample questions. We'll, we'll make, illustrate that, okay? So again, in-class questions are really going to happen every day. You do in-class questions, and when you do those questions, you realize things, you, you can add those items to your study tool. I realized that was a portacath was a central line. So under my central line notes, I'm going to add portacath, right? So you're adding to your study tools that you're going to be taking to your study groups. Okay. Again, by day three, this is example if you have clinical on Thursday, Friday, but this will kind of be offset. Maybe you'll do your clinical on Tuesday, Wednesday, and then definitely by your third business day or your third non-school day, you want to be able to have your um, study tools done and created. All your tables, all your concept maps, all your things. Really the only thing you're adding to them are things you find out in study group, things you find out in in-class questions, things you find out in clinical that you didn't realize, oh shoot, I know we shocked that rhythm, right? That they have shocked someone with, with a pulse. Or I thought you only shocked people that didn't have pulses, right? You realize, oh, there's a few rhythms I do shock with a pulse. So then you go ahead and manipulate your notes to make that make sense, right? So again, by the third business day, you have finished all of your uh, study tools. And then now it's time to take those study tools and go to where? To study group, right? So study group here in pink. And what's the maximum people in your study group? Good four. If it's a, it's a you know, four and a half, sometimes my, you know, fifth person sometimes could tag along, but usually four is going to be the, the sweet spot, okay? So study sessions at least three to four times a week. You're going to be bringing people together. You're going to be trying to find a uh, good study group because if study group's not working for you, you can go ahead and leave and make that study group have three people now. And now you can find another study group that will be ideal to your, uh, to your learning styles. And that can take a second to find in first semester, second semester, or third semester, but you want to be able to find something that's going to be able to, even if it's just two people, someone that's going to be able to bounce ideas off of, to teach things, take the whiteboard and start teaching the material to each other. Okay. 
So again, uh, the study sessions also you want to say, hey, we're talking about lines today. So in this study group right here, all lines, lines all, all the time. Don't get distracted talking about EKGs. Hey, do you realize there are some rhythms you have to shock? Right? So it's a good, it's a make, good, make it all about one thing. Try to be succinct as possible. Say, so, well, we'll talk about EKGs next study group, right? So then again, on the weekend, you can get some two study groups in if you have no life, which is what most of you should have. All right. Anyways, you're going to want to identify the topics you're going over and again, make sure there's no more than four people, right? And you can double dip. You can go into multiple study groups. You can have your three study groups you go to, and then you can be, you know, you can cheat on your study group and go to another study group, right? I was that, that person that was, hey, you want a study group? I'll go too, right? After I left, the, I, I got a study group at, you know, three to five, I'll hit, I'll hit you up at six, right? So then we'll, you know, you can, you can double dip and then you can bring information to that other study group because maybe you do the lines in one study group and now you can do EKG in the next study group. Right? You can get all that information and try to assimilate it is, is one thing, which is what you did with your, uh, your study tools, but the study groups are what you're going to do to be able to manipulate. Who, has, who keep count? How many times is that? Six? Anyways, you take them, you manipulate all the information, and you're going to be able to uh, you know, uh, make information make sense. It's going to be organized in your brain. Okay? So you want to have a good duration. You don't have a study group of 30 minutes. You don't have a study group of six hours. That's not going to make much, make much sense. You want to take healthy breaks. You want to take, when you, when, if it is six hours, like on the, before, the, before the exam, you want to take healthy breaks. You want to be able to you know, take, you know, make, it a, make sense to you. OK? So uh, what else? So again, we're going to study group, and you can take, you can pass, you can take your friends. You know, friends are friends, but no hard feelings. You can go to multiple study groups. That's not, that's not disallowed. We're not going to write you up on, on our notes. So, like that person in five freaking study groups, right? Anyways, <clears throat> you want to be able to assume this information as much as possible. And how many? We got no more than four. And you can get some big mondo study groups going. You know, once or twice, three times. But ideally, you want to keep them you know, around two to three hours. All right, just don't wait until the weekend all right, to do study groups. Your study group should be starting. When was that, that soonest study group? It was like day three. right? I finished all my study tools, and I'm already trying to get together, trying to find people. I may have finished all my tools on lines, and let's go over lines. And then I'll be able to finish my EKGs tomorrow, and let's do an EKG study group that, that evening. All right? So you want to be able to actively recall the information because when that information goes into your brain, right, it goes to your parietal lobes over there, to your primary sensory cortex, then it goes to your parietal lobe, to your parietal association areas, and then it's going to dissipate, right? It's, going, it's not going to stay there for long. Your goal is to get it into your deep nuclei and be able to recall it from the deep nuclei. So it goes in, and then you want to be able to take it out, and how do you get information out of your amygdala? It's not conscious, but how do you how do you practice that? You have to actually speak, right? You have to use your motor cortex, right? You have to use your motor cortex. You have to take that information, you have to take it out, and you have to actually speak it, right? And now we have information going two ways. It's going into your brain, and then you're speaking it, and it's going out of your brain. Now you're going to make different associations between that information, and that's how the brain works, right? That's how you try. That's how information storage works. Information goes in. And a lot of information in your brain says, I don't even know this. Why do I have to know what, what restroom acidosis is? When, when, when am I going to use that in real life? Right? So you have to make it think that restroom acidosis is important. So you have to keep using it. You have to keep making that association. Otherwise, information that goes in is going to get lost immediately if you don't recall it. You don't actively recall it. You don't actively learn that information again. Right? So that, you want to keep that information you know, up front in your brain so that you don't you stop you don't just quit losing uh, quit that information and say i don't even know about restriastosis alkalosis or anything anymore right so what does that mean that means day th two day three really should be every three days you should be recycling that information right you shouldn't be like say oh lines are easy central lines are easy. i know central lines i know peripheral ivs right and then you don't study it again until the, the weekend before the test and you're like shoot i forgot all about these things Right? You want to be able to start recalling that every at least three days. You want to try to recycle through that information. Okay? Your brain is very, very good at forgetting things. Right? There's a lot of information, like how, much, you know, how many cookies were there over there this morning. You probably took count when you came in. You took, got to grab, are those bagels or cookies? What are those? Anyways, you grabbed a bagel and you say, oh, there's, 20, there's 22 bagels here. Is that important information? 
No, but your brain's really good at forgetting that information. If, but if you were to keep recalling it right now, there's 22 bagels, there's 22 bagels, someone took one, that's 21 bagels. You're going to start keeping count, you're going to start paying attention, you're going to make that information try to hopefully mean sense, some sense to you, okay? So you will forget information if you don't actively recall that information. You have to constantly do this. So what does this look like? It's like going to study sessions, going to the whiteboard and say, okay guys, we're doing H or rhythms today. Let's do H or rhythms, bam. It's like, okay guys, we're learning about diabetes. What are the diabetes complications? You go through all the diabetes complications, right? You're going through all these things and you're trying to actively recall that information. All right, so study sessions keep you honest because you're gonna forget stuff, right? And if you forget stuff, you're not gonna forget it again, right? Unless it's like too much information, which is what nursing school in general. So that's why you have to try to recall as much as possible, okay? All right, so a study group is ghosting you. It's like, oh, you won't be at six o'clock. And they say, oh, you know what? My kids are sick, I can't go. Well, you can try to just find another one, All right? It's ideal, right? You, there's, there's this thing called Zoom nowadays, right? And it's free for two people, I think, still, right? Uh, if you get three people, it's 40 minutes, and then you just do another session, 40 minutes again, right? You can always, you know, there's, what, 33 people in 103 right now? You can, all, you can always find someone that's willing to, to reach out, right? You can teach anyone that's willing to listen. If you can't find a friend with quotes in, in nursing school, you can always find, you can always teach a cat, or not a stray cat, I guess you could teach a stray cat, all right? You can teach your plants, like this is AFib, right? Look at this guy, AFib, and you start doing your AFib dance, right? And then you can teach a significant other, they might not know anything about, about nursing or medicine, but you can still teach them stuff, right? So hey, I'm gonna teach you about sinus rhythm. All I gotta do is sit there, right? And you got to teach them, and then they can. You can say, ask me questions like, what's the treatment? What's the what are the, what are you going to do as a nurse? What are you going to? What are some causes? And you can prompt me, so that you give like a little flashcard of things they can ask you, right? Because these things don't change. We have to always ask you, what are the causes? What are the symptoms? What are the diagnostic tests? What are the complications? And what are the nursing interventions you might do for disease X or rhythm Y or drug X, right? So you can have your significant other. Your plant is not gonna be able to ask you those questions or your cat or dog, maybe some dogs, you know, they have those little things where the, you can hit the button and it tells you things, right? That might work, I don't know. You can set that up. If someone does, that'd be cool. <clears throat> All right, so that's the idea behind this information. You wanna get the information out of your brain. You wanna start practicing, taking the information out of your brain. You put the information in many, many times. You read it, you read it again, you created study tools. You wanna to be able to try to take the information out of your brain as efficiently as possible. Any questions on what I've been talking about so far? I realize I might have been talking fast. I got I to gotta slow down before I start lecturing on Monday because it's the winter break. I talk a little faster at times. All right, any questions so far? We're all good? All right, so actively learning the material. So you want to, again, you don't just put the information into your eyeballs, into your, into your brain. It has to leave your brain also, right? Anybody play music? Anybody get, get tortured as a kid? Playing piano or string instrument? Or still likes it? All right, anyways. So there's music out there, these things called sheet music, right? So where these, it's all the notes, all the information is there on the pages, right? It might be three pages, it might be 55 pages if it's a piano concerto, right? It's many, many pages of music and notes. That's a lot of information. Look at all that information there, right? I have to be able to get that information out at some point. And when is that, when is that exam day? That's the concert, right? The concert is exam day where I have to perform on this material. I have to be able to you know, express this material and have to be able to play it at a good pace, at a 70% or better. <laughs> have you gone to a piano concert and they perform 70% or better? That's not a good piano concert. You're not gonna follow that person again on YouTube. Anyways, that's gonna be a, that's your idea is to be at least close to 90 to 90% accurate in all the notes that you're responsible for. So how do you practice, how do you do that? How do you, how does a pianist get, get better? How does a violinist get better? They have to actually take the information out of their amygdala or their hippocampus, and they have to make it muscle memory as part of it, but also they have to be able to use their ears, they have to be able to use all their senses to try to get the information also out. They have to practice teaching the material. They have to practice the piano. They have to take the information out of their brain and take it from the sheet music to their brain, to their fingers, so they have to use all these senses to be able to perform adequately at concert time, right? So there's not some, there's not concert pianists out there who just read the sheet music and play it right there at that, at that time, right? It's some people are really good at that, but that's not, some people aren't gonna pay money to watch someone do that, right? 
no one pays money to watch you take a nursing exam either. But either way, that's, a, uh, that's the idea. You want to try to practice the information as much as possible. So how do you practice in nursing school? You have to teach the information. You have to take this information about AFib. You have to take this information about VTAC. And you have to take this information about Porticas, right? And you have to take that information and start working with it, right? You have to, if, if Porticas don't make sense, do you think this pianist is going to take practice once? No, if it's a complicated, not that Porticas are complicated, but they're going to practice it multiple, multiple times, right? Try to get that ideally at a performable level, at 70% or better, right? So teaching material <clears throat> is what's going to be able to get that information out efficiently. And you want to teach it closed note because is your, are, is your test open note? No, right? It's not open person. It's not open note. It's not open anything. It's all you, right? So you want to try to practice it as closed note as possible. Okay? So when you're teaching it, you're teaching AFib to somebody, you're going to go up there and you're going to teach AFib, right? And you forgot, oh shoot, it has stroke risk factors, right? I forgot about that complication altogether, right? I forgot that's one of the medications to do is to prevent a stroke. And what medication was that? And your study group goes silent and someone, you know, looks, then finally looks at their notes and say, oh guys, it was, it was these anticoagulants, right? So then now you're not going to forget that the next time when it comes exam day, like, oh shoot, I know stroke's actually a, a risk factor, right? So again, what is active learning? What is taking the music or taking information? What is active listening or what active learning? Reviewing your notes? That's just like taking the sheet music and the pianist on the bus looking at the sheet music. Is that going to help the pianist? Right? Taking the, that, that no, those notes and reading it in, in clinical? It might help a little bit, right? But your goal is to start asking questions off that, start practicing and manipulating the information. Okay? So if you rewrite the notes, if that pianist rewrites the notes again to just clean sheet music, does that help the pianist on exam day? No, all right? You might be able to do it once, right? When you're, we're gonna try to create your, all your study tools. They might you know, reformat it a little bit, make it look, so make it look, maybe, this, this, maybe the, the font was too big, I don't know what, what, what they do, but either way, you want to try to, you know, reading the book, is that gonna help? That's gonna put, take the information, put it in one, 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 one direction, right? I don't need one direction songs, but anyways, one direction is going to go into your brain and it might fine tune this information. You might realize, oh shoot, I didn't realize that was that, right? You might, you might, you might fix a few, one or two things, but the amount of effort and hours and the time you put into that might not be as great as if you were to take that information that you've already created and start talking about it, start practicing it, right? And you can practice it by A, teaching it, or also doing in class questions, right? Doing in class questions is almost exam day, right? That's what you're going to get in the exam is English questions, type questions, so you should start practicing those things, right? So teach the material to each other, right? So you see one, you do one, you teach one. Well, that's the kind of the, the mantra for, you know, anything, right? When you learn about Foley catheters and you see a Foley catheter inserted, are you good for Foley catheter insertions? No, you have to actually, you can teach someone, you can teach them exactly all the steps, and now you know the steps, but can you actually do it, right? So you want to try to practice as much as possible, okay? So creatively dissect the information, you dissect it together and try to make as many tables, is really good at helping compare between two disease processes. If you're comparing Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, you can realize, oh shoot, they're both they're both older people and they both are degenerative, right? And you realize that information, you have it in a table, you know, all stacked together, you realize, oh, these ones happen acutely, like myosinia gravis. That's just a, that happens, you know, that can happen to anybody, you know, old age, young age, and you realize those differences when you start comparing the information, right? And now in your study group, you can say, hey guys, what neuro disorders affect young people? What neuro disorders are degenerative? What neuro disorders are temporary that might have a, a hospital stay and then now they're, they're better, right? All right, so try to fool each other with, with questions. Try to do as much fooling as possible in study, in study groups or in clinical when you have your little notes with you. You're going to try to fool each other as much as possible. Try to ask questions and manipulate. Who's taking keep account? All right, manipulate the information as much as possible. Okay, and again, doing endless questions. Again, don't do endless questions in your study group unless you have like absolute bangers, ones that are great. Like, guys, yeah, just fooled me. What do you think? I think this is something that Professor Groban will ask, or Professor Smith will ask. All right, they're going to definitely ask this kind of question. I've seen this question before. All right, you can bring those to study group, but they don't spend all your time in study group just reading endless questions to each other. That's not going to be the best use of your time. All right, the best use of your time is teaching the, the material and trying to ask questions that you're creating on the material. Okay. 
All right, so half the battle will be successful is getting the most correct answers. And we know that that's a troublesome thing, but that's what's going to happen in real life is that you're going to have to, there's many, many correct answers, many things you could do. Raising the head of bed is actually a great answer many, many times. But someone's in cardiac arrest, raising the head of bed might not be the best answer, right? So you have to figure out what the best thing to do is, right? Which can be hard. So that's why you want to be able to try to again, manipulate the information and try to figure out, well, shoot, uh, that, that's important, but what's the best thing? What's going to fix this rhythm, right? Like if someone has a really bad EKG rhythm and their blood pressure is low, you know, doing a 12-lead EKG is not going to be the best answer, right? Blood pressure is really low. i got to fix that low blood pressure, right? Someone's not breathing, you know, raising the head of bed is good, but I need to maybe apply oxygen or do something that's going to fix the priority situation. All right, if you're reading, doing in-class questions, you're reading textbooks, you're reading things, you're watching YouTube videos, you're watching Nurse Sarah online YouTube, what are you going to do if you, if you see a conflict? Nurse Sarah says do this, and uh, what is it? Nurse Mike says do this, and Professor Groven says that, but if you learn from this professor, do this, and your textbook says X, who is the person you, walk, you talk to? That's the instructor. That's the one that's going to be the one that's writing the exams, unfortunately, so that's the one that you want to be able to ask and that, that's the, who's going to be the that's going to be the most correct answer in that situation. When you do take the NCLEX, NCLEX it has been peer reviewed by like hundreds upon hundreds of uh, different professors out there and different nurse educators out there. So those the right answer will always be the right answer on the NCLEX. But when you're you have to play the game when you're in nursing school, you do have to play to the what's the word? Play what's the phrase? Just play the game. Anyways. So you want to be able to know what the correct answer is. So that way, in study group, you can also bring, I asked the professor, this is, what, this is what they said. This is what you do for this situation. All right, any questions on that? Oh, this guy's only on slide five. What the heck? All right, so learning styles. So it's controversial, but learning styles don't really improve exam scores, don't improve that it actually helps. All right, say, oh, I'm, a, I'm a visual learner. I'm going to do everything visual. It can help, it's gonna be great, but what helps the most is using all the learning styles, right? If you use every single learning style, that's going to be the, make you the most successful. If you just use one primary thing, like I'm audio, I listen to MP3s all day long, I wake up, I hit my MP3 player, I got 12 MP3 players, look at my coat, right? I got all these MP3 players, I'm an audio learner. But that's not gonna help you as much as if you see it in clinical or if you actually do a Foley insertion, that's not gonna be as good. Are listening about Foley insertions like ASMR, I don't, I don't know what that, what, that, what that looks like. Many ways you're gonna, or hear it sounds like, but it's gonna, there's no evidence that that's actually gonna help you help uh, you know, perform the best. What helps you perform the best is using all of your senses. All right, so kinesthetic means you're practicing skills. If it's a skill like doing Alaris pumps and <laughs> IV piggybacks, you have to practice doing that. You can read all the steps, you can do some drawings, Right? And say, like, I'm a visual learner, I'm going to draw how I hang an IV piggyback. But you know, actually, you can, that's going to help you. That's going to be a little you know, in your mind's eye as you start doing this, the, the, the procedure. But you want to try to do, uh, you want to try to physically do it. You want to try to draw it. You can listen to how it's done, I guess. Right? But you want to try to use all your senses as possible. All right? Going back to like exam notes, right? they had like a, a cleaning symposium in here yesterday. There's all kinds of cleaning supplies. Like, what, what happened here? Either way, so you, when you're doing all your, all your lecture notes and you're doing all your lecture exam stuff, you want to try to get, uh, you know, want to do the reading and writing portion is where that's kind of kinesthetic, but also it's kind of taking information and putting it into some, some materials that you can take with you, A, to clinical, or also take with you to study groups so that you can start to assimilate the information as good as well, as the best to your capacity as possible. Right? So reading and writing is going to start checking that box for these different learning styles. Right? Auditory, you can listen to the lecture again. Right? You don't want to be doing it all the time because that's not the, almost the best use of your time. I mean, if you're, you can't find any study groups, right? you, already, you already went on all the different forums, try to find any study groups. It's like, hey, you go to that nursing school, okay, let's try it. Let's, let's just try to get, you, get, get someone I can, I can start talking uh, about the information to. And that's not, you want to be able to you know, try to speak the information, you want to try to write the information out, you want to go to a whiteboard and start writing out all the things that you're learning for the exam, all right? All right, only really listen, I guess, maybe if you're like driving, right, you got a long drive, and maybe that's a great use of your time, okay? 
All right, so use all the areas of the brain. We have use all the areas of the brain. That's what's going to make information stick. So we talked about the, you know, the, the pre-central gyrus, the post-central gyrus information goes in. So if this is your eyeballs over here, right? So just like, imagine it's an eyeball. Information goes into your brain, right? And then it has to get stored, right? You have to make that information important. And it might go to the central areas in your deep nuclei to be stored for later. But if you don't actively recall the information, you're not going to know how to do that in the future. So you have to take that information from there, you have to take it back out, and you actually have to practice it, just like our pianist has to take that information, they have to actually start manipulating it, all right? So you want to be able to use all the different areas of the brain. So the, in, right here in your brain, you have, yes, you have your memory centers, your amygdala and hippocampus, but you also have other areas. You have your visual areas back in the occipital lobe. So you want to use as much vision. So now when you, you see that again, or you've seen that in clinical, or you've seen that on Grey's Anatomy, or you've seen that on House, you've seen that on, what's another good popular show nowadays? Either way, those are popular shows when I was in nursing school that I watched all the time. This guy knew nothing about nursing, nothing about medicine, so I watched those things, so now I saw, oh, that patient has CHF, look at that, right? Or that patient has anxiety, look at that, right? So I can see all those things, and now I have that there, and it goes to my little, my, my memory centers and the deep nuclei of my brain, and now I can speak to it. It's like, hey, I saw this episode, and that patient definitely had CHF. Right? So I saw some pink frothy sputum. Right? It's really cool. Look at that. Right? So you start making that visual, uh, visual connection. Right? If you have your auditory centers here, now you're going to start listening. You're going to start creating those different areas or start connecting. You're going to start the more you make, the better. So you have auditory areas here. You have the different sensory areas. You have motor areas. Start making connections. So it's all going to start making sense okay so that's the idea use all the areas of the brain right with the least amount of stress as possible because your brain doesn't work great with stress it doesn't make connections when you are stressed so it's like well shoot i'm in nursing school that's that's part of the game you want to try to be as, li as less stress least stress as, as possible okay you got to coddle your amygdala and hippocampus you want to make sure that it's using the information as much as possible it's bringing information together. It's making as many connections, literal synapse connections, right? A synapse goes from point A to point B, right? You want to make another synapse connect that, another synapse connect it, another synapse connect it, another one. You want all those things to start making sense as much as possible. Okay, so how do you lower your anxiety? How do you make yourself as, as, as better, as best you, as you can be, all right? So finding an optimal study area can help, right? Finding a place to study, going to different study areas, right? You just study at home. Sometimes we're stuck at home because we have kids or, or our older kids, like our spouses, need attention. So that can be a, an issue. That can, it might keep us at home, but if you are able to get out, try to go to an area that you can study at. Multiple areas, the better. The better. So if you go to three hours here, four hours there, you can try to get different locations. We'll kind of reset your brain and try to get you as organized as, organized as possible. And there's some places that are open 24 hours. Denny's still open 24 hours? We've gone to Denny's recently. It's $3. Is it still $3 for breakfast? Either way. It's 20, you know, it's, it's 24 hours, I think, still. There's different other 24 hours, 24 hour places around that you can go to to try to get in there to study as much as possible, right? I study best at from, from 8 to 12, 2 a.m. That's my, that was my sweet spot. So I, you know, not many places were open. Maybe, you know, Barnes & Noble's closed at 10 or 11. But after that, where do I go? It's like, well, I need to go somewhere. Because if I go home, I'm going to be too loud or I might just fall asleep on my bed, right? I can't study horizontal. That's not going to work, right? So I need to go to different places, right? Have to have different study areas that are going to help me help me focus, right? Avoid distractions, bring your music, dedicate time. Nursing school takes all your time, but you want to try to, you know, carve out the time as best you can. Add different areas will kind of keep you energized as well, all right? And study time, you want to try to limit yourself to up to two hours, right? That's better than six to eight hour huge sessions in a row. It's like I, I carved out all this whole Saturday. That's all study time. That's not going to be as effective as if you were to do two to three hours every day, right? Or do four hours if you've got the time every day. Okay, and different sessions at different locations, right? So small study sessions are better than Mondo sessions, right? So you could combine this, right? Do two four-hour sessions every day, and then on the weekend, do your huge, your huge session. If you are doing a huge session, take breaks at least every hour. Eat snacks, stay hydrated, right? Nursing school, you can lose weight after nursing school. 
Okay, that's that you're going to gain a lot of calories and you're gaining a lot of fat in nursing school, unfortunately, if you haven't already. All right. So caffeine is only temporizing. All right. It's not going to keep you awake all the time. So you want to be able to, you can use it if you're doing some, some short sessions, but you want to, you know, you don't want to go overboard. Please know that the max amount of caffeine every day is 400 milligrams. All right. I want people going to dine at Panera. All right. When does Panera open? Anyways, people die at Panera for eating too many lemonades, too many energized lemonades. All right, so don't you know, don't overdo it in that in that capacity. Get sleep. All right, it's like I don't have any time for sleep, but your information is not going to be organized. All the information on the previous slide that we we're trying to put in all different areas and all different associations, those synapses, they actually gel and form when you actually sleep. All right, and if you have a a, a computer from the 90s or the early 2000s where you had to defrag your computer to make it work better. Right? The same thing that goes on in our brain. When we sleep at night, we organize information, and all the excess information shows up in our weird, weird dreams. Right? So now you start all this information you did not need to know is now going to be in a dream, and you're not going to, you're not going to remember it because it was just trying to trash it. Right? But the information you do need to recall the next day will be filed away, and now you can easily get that information out the next time. Okay? So six to eight hours is optimal for A, for stress, and for also B, for making information uh, filed away appropriately. Okay, your brain defrags during the night. This is defragging here. Okay, and it sorts and stores information for better recall the next day. Right. So doing put all this information into your hard drive on a Saturday before the exam is not going to be optimal. Right, because you're probably not going to get any sleep that whole weekend before the exam. All right, you want to try to get it in there as much as possible throughout the weeks. Up to leading up to your exam because, again, you're going to forget the information after about three to four days. Okay? So this is the best thing you can do for your studying. All right? Everyone's going to the beach, the bar, working out and partying. I'm just over here trying to be a nurse, trying not to get fat in nursing school. All right? So I go, oh, I don't have that. My hard drive's not that big. Anybody can, can sort information, right? Anybody can learn anything, right? It is possible, right? If you use the right strategies to get it there. All right, so how do I get all of the information into my tiny Homer-sized brain? Well, you, if you understand the why of information, that's going to make it stick, right? Because our social security is seven letters. Is seven or is it ten? Nine, nine-ish. All right, our phone numbers are ten, right? If you include the, one, the 661, all right, or, the, or your area code, all these things are going to, you know, that's why they're like seven to ten digits, right? When there's people's phone numbers or other things, are, the human brain can't memorize multiple, multiple things. It's not going to work, right? There are things you do have to bring to nursing school to memorize, right? Like 10% of it is memorizing, like lab ranges. Once was something you had to memorize. Nowadays, the new NCLEX doesn't really actually require you to know that. They just need to make you recognize that something is elevated or decreased, right, on the lab. So they'll give you the lab ranges right there for you. But what you do have to memorize, like medication names, that can be troublesome. You know, all those are medications, right? So when they're studying diabetes and there's 13 different diabetes class of medications and there's like three to five for each class, right? that can be really hard to memorize. But when you understand some mnemonics to help you get there, that's going to get you the memorization. But again, memorization is not what we are testing you on. We're testing you on, not, we're not going to say, hey, can you name all five diabetes medication of this certain class? That's not what we're testing. We're testing on whether you know that those medications have this life-threatening major adverse cardiac event or MACE, right? Do you, they recognize that this person will get fatter on this medication or this, this medication will get someone Kim Kardashian size, right, Ozempic, right? It's going to make you lose weight and losing weight will help people with type 2 diabetes. So it's like that's the important thing, right? So diet exercise is always the right answer, but diet and exercise is really important for some disease processes. Okay, you can memorize that, but you want to try to use the, you know, and try to understand information, right? And memorizing demographics and statistics is really not going to help you. The NCLEX is not going to test you on that as much. And it's not going to, I mean, understand like a sickle cell disease patient is, is more common in certain populations is important. But when Ms. Jones starts having like AFibs, like, oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot, she's Caucasian, she's Ashkenazi Jew, oh my gosh, it's just a 30% chance of developing AFib. So that's not going to help somebody in real life, right? So you have to be able to know what to do for the AFib, what's the treatment, what are the complications that can happen, all these things, right? That's going to help you as mu as much, much more. Understanding the complications, understanding you know, why something is the way it is, why it's important to teach them to take that anticoagulant is important, right?
understanding why they have these symptoms, right? We can give you a list of 10 to 15 symptoms for every disease process, but you're not gonna memorize that. But if you understand the why, why AFib has this symptom, why CHF has this symptom, why COPD has this symptom, when you get the why, you can get there every time, right? You can try to get to the right answer as much as possible because you know I don't know all the symptoms, but when I try to think about the disease process, oh shoot, that affects that little area right there. I get to the symptoms, get to the treatment, get to the education. I should give the patient every single time. Okay, so symptoms, causes, you want to be able to know why those are associated with that disease, why that's the important thing to teach, teaching diet exercise, teaching them to raise the head of the bed, that's going to be the right answer all the time, but is that the most correct answer in this situation? All right, why medication theta is given for disorder alpha? Why is that the priority for the medication? Why is that important medication? You know, all people that have atherosclerotic risk factors should take aspirin, but if, they, if they're also a COPD patient, they should be taking their, they should have their rescue inhaler nearby, right? That's, that's more important for that patient acutely, okay? All right, so exams will not test you on memorization. When you came from, if you're coming from fundamentals, a lot of your exam content was memorization and a lot of the content you learned in your undergraduate, you know, and prereqs was also memorization. You, you took the information, you memorized it, and you onto the test, right? You intellectually vomited it onto the test. That's not what nursing school is. Nursing school is, are you safe? Are you do understand that this is important, right? Because there's a lot of information you could vomit onto the test, but we're not gonna unfortunately test you on every single little thing. There's too many things to test you on, but we want to test you on the things that are important, the things that are life-saving, life-altering, things that are extremely important, right? And things that are making you critically think. So if you're there in real life, can you realize I have all these things that are correct in front of me? I could see my other patient and fix their pain, but if my other patient has low blood pressure, that's, that's all, those are both correct answers. I gotta fix both of those. But what's the most correct thing? What's the thing I'm going to do for this patient? Can I understand all the symptoms in front of me? This patient has pain. This patient has a BP of 80 over 40. This patient has, you know, they have a SAT of 87%. This patient has, you know, they have AFib on the monitor. Well, what's these, I can assess all this information, but what is the most important thing for me to do at this point, right? Can I critically think that information and get to the right answer, all right? In MedSurge 1, 70% of the questions are going to be critical thinking questions. If you memorize all the information from lecture, from textbook, from, from the lab and diagnostic book that you all, guys, all, all of you read, right? If you read all that information and you, can, can you, and you memorize it all, will you, is a 30% score gonna pass? No, so you have to be able to understand that information. It has the best way of understanding is critically thinking and making the associations so why those things are important, okay? In message two, 85% of the questions are critical thinking. In message three, 100% of the questions. There's not, there shouldn't be any memorization question there, right? There shouldn't be any statistic question about what Ashkenazi Jews are at risk for. That doesn't help, that's not gonna help you when you get into the fields, right? You realize you read someone's journal, shoot, they're an Ashkenazi Jew, what the heck? I know this, right? That's not, but they're here, they might not be here for that, that reason, okay? So you want to be able to know what's the most uh, important thing for the patient. And you learn about these test taking strategies as well, like ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation is going to be really important to get you through to the right answer as well. All right. When you have those three to four patients we talked about, which one should I see first? Well, that patient's blood pressure is super low. I, I got to fix that. All right. That's a, that's a, you know, that's a, a circulation problem. So, well, SATs are low. I mean, that's also a problem too. But so we we'd probably give you more information to make you hone in on the right answer, and so will the NCLEX. Again, peer reviewed by hundreds upon hundreds of professors and educators, they made sure that a nurse going into the field will recognize that this is an important um, patient to see first, and they will make sure the answer is gonna get you there every time, okay? So we know the why behind each behind each uh, symptom, behind each treatment, behind each cause, and so you can get to the right answer every time. All right, so critical thinking. What is critical thinking? All right, that's a, that's a buzzword we throw around all the time. So you're not critically thinking enough, right? What does critical thinking even mean? Well, that's when you take all the information, all right? Remembering stuff, that's memorizing, right? Being able to remember it and, and you know, vomit it onto the test, that's just memorizing and remembering stuff. Understanding is something good we should teach you on. Do you understand that um, B and P means that they, have, they might have some CHF or fluid overload? Yeah, that's, that's important but taking all the information and 
manipulating it is what's going to get you to the critical thinking level, taking all that information in front of you and saying, oh shoot, this patient's airways at, at risk, or shoot, this patient has a arrhythmia that's causing some life altering problems, right? So taking all the information, analyzing stuff, assessing all the information in front of you and coming up with what the best next action is or what treatment would be expected or what complication might be developing in front of your eyes, right? And then evaluating is taking all that information and saying, again, what, in what intervention should I do? I have all this information and I have many interventions I could do and they're all correct. Raising the head of bed's on there. Putting the bed in a low lock position is also on there. But what's the most correct answer, right? Evaluating everything in front of me, I, sh well, I should be doing this because the patient is having this complication right now or needs this treatment right now or needs this education because now they're here with a stroke and they didn't take their anticoagulant for AFib, right? So the best thing to teach them, you gotta take this medication, right? And then creating is at the top of critical thinking. That's where you're able to create stuff. And that's what the whiteboard is for. That's what your Zoom whiteboard is for, where you draw things and you, and you teach the material. You create the information kind of from scratch, from with closed notes and say, let me teach you about ventricular rhythms. Let me teach you about asystole and the causes, treatments, and, and uh, well, symptoms are dead. But the, uh, you know, what, what am I going to do about this patient? What, do with this, what nursing interventions can I do for a patient that is dead in front of me? Okay, so that's questions, drawing, tabling, teaching the material, and actively understanding the information. Okay, so again, another good way to practice is in class questions. In class questions, usually in the back of the, the book with the rationales are there, it tells you what kind of question it is. It'll tell you if it's a apply, application level question, it'll tell you if it's an evaluation question, it'll tell you if it's an understanding question. So you want to try to kind of check your, check your work to make sure you're doing critical thinking level questions, right? You want to try to get in about 50 in-class questions. I guess that's really, really 100, isn't it, for doing two dumbbells of 50 in-class each. But anyways, you want to do about 50 per day minimum. That's going to, you know, in the morning, we, you know, separate out as much as possible, right? We don't have time for push-ups in nursing school, but you might do have time for in-class questions. All right, you want to try to get them as, in as much as possible. That's going to try to, that's going to get the information squared away, right? A, that's, going to, that's what you're going to see in the exam, but also B, it's going to take the information that you might have read in front of you. It's like there's way too much information, but then now you try to say, it kind of fine tunes what the most important thing is. Like when you read, you know, 10 different English books and it always asks about, uh, you know, I don't know, about an asthma patient and making sure they have the rescue inhaler. It's like, well, you're gonna, whenever you see that, that question, you're always gonna go to asthma, inhaler, 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 every single time. And sure enough, on the NCLEX, that's gonna be the right answer. Now on your exam, that's gonna be the right answer too, because they, that's, of all the information, they say, well, that's, that is the priority. You had 100 different people that write those NCLEX books or NCLEX questions, and they said, you know, that's probably the most priority in that situation, that is the priority that should happen, okay? All right, again, don't spend your time in study group doing in-class questions unless you found really good in-class questions. Like, hey, look at this, it's a really good one, All right? All right, trying to create questions is gonna help you the best as well. Trying to create questions off the content and creating different creative ways to say, hey, hey look, let's look at this, at the, all, these, all these medications here, which one's the, the, you know, the medication that has the most complications? That's probably the one that's to be tested on, like metformin, always tested, hold it before the day of a procedure with contrast, right? That's always asked. What, that's the only thing you're gonna ask about metformin is A, it's gonna be held on a day of procedure with contrast, or B, it's gonna be held when? When someone has some renal dysfunction, some renal impairment, some chronic kidney disease, some acute kidney injury, all those things. So kidneys or contrast, that's all, that's all, it's really all the things you can't ask on metformin, right? Maybe there might be some left field answer about it causes lactic acidosis if they, if they overdose on it. But really, what are we gonna ask to make you a safe nurse, right? Someone's not gonna say, well, what's their lactic acid level? No, they're gonna say, what's their creatinine for their kidney function and are they having a procedure today? And do I hold it 24 hours pre and 48 hours post, right? So those are the things I learned about metformin. That's what we're trying to instill in you. And that's what the things that, that the NCLEX wants to know that you know that are safe. That if you look at a medication list, you say, well, shoot, that met, what medication on this list is a problem? Well, metformin is a problem, right? Because if they're getting a procedure or they have this creatinine that is elevated. Again, you don't have to know if the actual number if it's greater than 1.3, but you, it will, you'll give you the range. It'll say creatinine 1.8. And well, shoot, that's, that's a problem. So are you able to recognize and evaluate all those labs and say that's a problem and then analyze the chart and say, well, shoot, they're getting a procedure today. The creatinine is 1.8. 
that's, I, I, they are on metformin also, that's an issue. So again, we can only ask you so many things on the information, all right? And when I was in nursing school, I went to Barnes and Noble and I grabbed all the NCLEX books, all right? That, I didn't take the plastic, the plastic packaging off, I had ethics. But I did go through all the NCLEX books that were open. Some people took the plastic packaging off. So I was like, oh shoot, cool, all right? And I went there you know, at least three to four times a week and I was going there, going through all their NCLEX books that were possible. And now they put them behind the counter. I don't think it was me, but I think that, but that they are available. And also you can go online on Amazon. You can buy the previous edition. Things don't change. The NCLEX does questions, will question you on the things in the last five years. So if you get the NCLEX book that is one edition sooner or previous to the current edition, it's probably it's being marked down immensely. Like if it normally sounds for 50, 60 bucks, it's probably be 20, 30 bucks. If you buy the previous edition, it's probably 10 bucks. If you buy the edition before that, it's probably five bucks, three bucks, right? It's incredibly cheap when you look at previous editions. Amazon will make it really hard. You have to go, you have to scroll down three times to get to the previous edition, but it will it will be there and it's super cheap. Or you go to some other online source, it will give you previous editions of books and they are very, very cheap. You can buy, I had I had like six different English books at home, 60. I had all kinds of different books from different different uh, publishers and previous editions. I was a really, really poor college student. I didn't have a you know Starbucks card. I I, I went uh, I carpooled to clinic every day. I'd have a car. My car had a carburetor. I didn't know how to fix a carburetor. It worked for like one semester. It was you know I, I was able to you know I had I was a poor college student. But I was able to afford sixty dollars worth of English books at three dollars a piece. All right, that's twenty different books right there. All right, They're able to, to a, 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 and then also going to Barnes Noble and using their, their free resources. But also our library has English books. The public library has English books. LA County Library has like 50 different libraries that you can get an English book delivered to you, right? To your to the local library, and it'll, it'll it'll arrive, right? So there's ways to get questions out there, and you just search online EKG questions NCLEX into Google, and you'll get you know they, they, there's like 13 different pages of Google. Right, and you can go to the second page of Google, but and you'll fi still find a whole bunch of things on the first page of Google of practice English questions. Some of them will make you try to buy stuff. You don't have to buy it. You just go to the different next website. You use ten more questions. Next website, ten more questions. Next website, ten more questions. And every single publisher puts their questions online as well for each chapter. You go to the cardiac chapter for ten different textbooks. You're going to find those those practice questions, which are usually knowledge based. You really want to focus on NCLEX questions, but there's a lot of questions out there that are possible. Right, I was I was easily going through about 500 questions a day of trying to assimilate all this information, and you try to you start fine tuning the, the the material and saying, well, shoot, I can only ask these many questions in metformin. I've not seen another question on metformin, right? That doesn't ask about those three things about kidney failure and uh, you know it's a diabetic and it is they have a, a contrast procedure. All right, does that make sense as far as questions? Looking at questions that were already created, right, and also making questions of your own can help you assimilate the information. All right, so here's some example questions on what critical thinking looks like. We showed you that you know you can have a, just a memorization question like, what are the symptoms for hyperkalemia, right? And you can memorize those symptoms, but a patient's not going to tell you, oh shoot, I'm having some, uh, you know, what is it? I'm having some. I can feel it. I'm getting bradycardic. Right? They're not going to tell you that, right? They're going to, you're going to get actual symptom reports. You're going to get the, you have to be able to teach them, hey, when you're on this medication, make sure you look out for these symptoms, right? So, like, uh, it's question one at the top. This one is a analysis, or what is this? This is a, just a memorization of facts, right? Sinus tachycardia is caused by what, right? What do these things cause sinus tachycardia? Well, you can just easily look at your lecture notes and say, well, shoot, those things were on there. I'm a good memorizer, All right? But we're not gonna be asking you those kind of questions, right? So which one, what's the right answer? C, severe infection. That's gonna be on your test. It'll say fever, it'll say infection, all the things that are infection. You can, you can memorize that. It could be in NCLEX questions. It can be in your lecture notes. But that's not the kind of question we should be asking. We should be asking you critical thinking questions, analysis level questions. Question two right here, right? Which would these, you have to analyze that rhythm. Before it told you, science, patient has sinus tachycardia. But is the patient gonna call, you know, ring the call bell and say, you know what? I'm feeling very sinus tachycardia right now. I think that's what I have, right? Is that gonna be the, a real life situation? No, you're gonna look at the monitor if they're in the tele unit or they're feeling like my heart's racing, I'm feeling palpitations. And you throw them on, 
uh, monitor and you see, well, shoot, they got a fast rhythm. And you got to interpret that rhythm, right? Which is what you have to, that's why we're teaching you. And what is that rhythm right there? Spoiler, that's sinus tachycardia, right? So sinus tachycardia, you've interpreted the information, you've analyzed it, and now that's the, you know, what is, what's the right answer now? Still high lactate. Now you have to understand that infection has some symptoms attached to it. So we're going, we're like going one step further, right? It could be high lactate, it high white blood cell count. It can say they have a fever. All these things could be, you know, signs of infection, right? All those things are fair game, right? And high PCO2, well, low PCO2 could also be a reason for a sinus tachycardia because low PCO2 means someone's breathing fast because there's something going on. There could be an infection going on. But high PCO2 leads to bradycardia. So when you're doing these, you want to look at the rationales and try to, because on the test, they could easily flip this and say low PCO2, right? And it could be a SATA. Oh, shoot, those guys, they're, you know, they're, they spoiled it, made their, their, they don't have my best interest at heart, they give me SATA questions, right? But we could easily make that a SATA question and add some more things. Like low hemoglobin A1C, does that affect your Mickey size tachycardia? No, that means you have well-controlled diabetic. But if someone has low hemoglobin, that's an anemia patient, and that's, that could cause sinus tachycardia. Low magnesium, that causes arrhythmias and ectopy and all kinds of PACs, PBCs, PJCs, oh my. It can cause all kinds of stuff, not really sinus tachycardia. So we can look at that. And then high magnesium could cause, if that said high, right? So high equals Brady also. So they could just flip the script on this, give us a bradycardia, and now you've got to select the ones that cause bradycardia. So knowing the rationale will help you because on the test, it could be e either way, right? You can ask you know, 10 different questions just on this information. Change it up to bradycardia, change it up to ectopy, change it up to this, change it up to different rhythms, and that will get you to different answers every time. But you want, what's the question asked me right now? Let's ask about sinus tachycardia. What if, what if it was sinus bradycardia? Now, now I have to recognize what causes sinus bradycardia. Instead of memorizing all those things, you want to try to sort of manipulate the information and try to fool each other, right? You can get, you can get flashcards if that works for you. You can get different rhythms and say, hey, here's a rhythm. What is it? And then what's the treatment for it? And then you pull up another one. What is, what is this rhythm right here and what might cause it? What's the nurse intervention I might do? What are the complications of this? Well, complications of sinus tachycardia, well, shoot. What is that? Okay, complications of AFib, I know it's a stroke, but what's complications of sinus tachycardia? Then that's gonna, you're gonna start making those connections, right? Because if you can't remember it, you're gonna remember the next time you find the right answer. What's the right answer? Complication of sinus tachycardia. It's okay, we'll find out on Monday, all right? So sinus tachycardia can cause myocardial demand and cause an MI, or it can cause a low blood pressure if it's too fast, you can't fill your heart with blood fast enough, that's a complication, is low blood pressure, all right? Anyways, next step, it's like there's more steps. What if you have this rhythm right here, and it says the nurse notes the rhythm above, and they have these labs. So now you're flipping through a chart. They got a MAG of 27. They got a glucose of 189. They got a lactate of 16. They got a PCO2 of 44. Well, now you have to be able to interpret more information, right? That's a higher level question, right? We're not just intellectually vomiting sinus tachycardia causes, right? We have to know what, to, what are we going to do next, right? So what would be the right answer? C. Notice that C was the correct answer every time. It's the same question every single time, except it's just increased in difficulty, right? Infection was the right answer every time, right? But what is the correct answer, right? Is to, you know, what, how do I get to the correct answer each time? I have to be able to interpret or analyze that information, okay? Can you do, for question three, can you do all the above plus recognize what's the most important might be a tricky thing, especially if we throw a stat at you, right? Minister antibiotics versus raise the head of bed? Well, shoot, they might be hypoxic might be, have a low O2, but by raise the head of bed, that's not really going to fix. The reason why they're hypoxic is they have an infection or like a pneumonia or something. That is the priority, is to give the antibiotics, right? All right, so there are test taking skills that will get you there, right? You look at ABC, you look at ADPI. What is ADPI? ABC is airway breathing circulation. What is ADPI? Assess, diagnose, plan, intervention, evaluation, right? It could be asking you, what's the next intervention? Well, assessment is not the correct answer. 
in, it's asking for an intervention, not an assessment, right? It could be say, what will you assess next? Well, I'm going to assess, I might assess, if someone has an infection, I might assess vital signs, I might assess all the things that caused sinus tachycardia. I'm going to assess each one of those things, right? But it's asking for what's the intervention I'm going to do. So you have to, these are test taking things. You'll, I think we're going over some study stuff later today, but those are things you learn when you start looking at NCLEX questions. You're, you look at NCLEX question, you bring it to your study, you're like, why was this the correct answer, not this one? These both look correct. You can bring it to me, you can bring it to your instructor. And they can say, well, why is that one correct? Well, it could be wrong. Things are wrong. I'm wrong. Books are wrong. That happens, right? That can happen, but sometimes it, it, it's legitimately asking a good question. And it's a banger that you want to bring to your study group, you want to bring to class, you want to bring to you know, reviews and say, well, why is this the correct answer? And we can go through it and say, well, that's the best one because ABCs, or it was asking for an intervention, not an assessment, right? All right, so med surge framework, tables and concept maps. We talked about this, there's things you wanna create in your first couple of days after lecture. You wanna start creating little tables that are going to take that information. It's gonna be using your kinesthesia, using your, your uh, you know, physical uh, attributes and other things that are going to make the information and take it from, you know, from your different sources and all kind of put it into one, one place. And that one place can be a table. And it can be, you know, two, three, four pages, five pages. But the easy thing is that it fits in your clinical uh, binder. You can bring it to you to clinical. You can bring it to you to work. If you, some of you guys need to make money to survive through school, you can bring it to work. You can bring it to all kinds of places. That way you can study these different tables. You can study something different every day. You want to try to get the active recall going. So it's not going to leave your brain. You don't want to just leave central lines for the last day. You want to try to rotate it through. Okay. So the idea of when doing tables, is to separate it into these different sections. These are things we will ask you. We will ask you what are the causes? What are the treatments? What are the symptoms? What are the diagnostic tests? What are the complications if they don't manage their disease or they might present to the emergency room with this, this complication because they didn't A, didn't take the treatment or B, they just their disease process is irreversible and it leads to this step, right? And then interventions, interventions to prevent them from coming back to the hospital. When should they call 911? What are things I'm going to teach them, right? So this is an example for diabetes and comparing type one and type two. And we put it in a table, you realize, well, shoot, this is all diabetics, type one and type two. I'm gonna teach them all these things, right? I'm gonna, these are the causes for each one of these. These are the symptoms for each one of these, the diagnostic tests for each one. A hemoglobin A1C, that's every single diabetic, whether they have type one, type two, type three, type four, type gestational, all the, all the diabetes, A1C, that's gonna be a good answer, right? So you realize that and then that's gonna be a right answer. But usually we ask you what's the wrong, what's the, what's the answer that's different, right? Like which complication only affects uh, type twos, right? And that's HHS. It's impossible to get on type ones. You could memorize that, but if we start to understand it, then you can get to it every single time. Well, that's impossible because of X, right? So on these tables, you want to put little rationales behind why is it impossible? When you go to your study group, someone says, oh, HHS can happen in type ones. Like, no, 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 that's impossible. And then someone tells you why it's impossible. And you kind of add it to your notes, well, it's impossible, blah, 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 right? So you add that information in and your table is, you know, it will make sense. It's not just a list of facts that you have to memorize for the test. It actually gets you to the right answer every time. All right, so making tables will compare things, tell you what's different. That way you can see, oh shoot, HHS only belongs to which type? Type two. So if my patient has, is, my question's asking me about a type one patient, I'm gonna cross off HHS. I know that's not a complication. So it can, lets you focus down on more, more or less, you have a better opportunity of a 25% chance to get it right, to a 33% chance of getting it right. Okay, unless we're evil and we write static questions for you, and then you have to select all that apply. Okay, and again, general stuff over here, cool stuff, cool stats, cool story, bro. Right, it affects Ashkenazi Jews, it affects uh, women in their 30s, it affects these the people. It's like, okay, that's cool. JFK had, had Addison's, cool, right? But that's not gonna, maybe it might be good for your concept map. You slap JFK on Addison's disease, that'd be a good one. But you know, all, when we start getting all little different stats and statistics, we're not going to test you on statistics. We're not going to say which one of these presidents had Addison's, JFK, Roosevelt, right? So it's not, that's not what we're testing you on. That's not going to be a in-class question. That's not going to be a nursing school question as well. Okay. So the other tables that are possible. So this is the disease process here, right? This all is a disease process. 
There can be tables for complications. It can be a separate table just for complications. Like diabetes has all kinds of complications. Their feet can fall off, their ears can fall off, their penis can fall off, everything can fall off. All the vessels get super small and narrow. They get strokes, get heart attacks. These are all different complications, right? So you might want to have a table just for complications because there's a lot of them sometimes. AFib just has like two complications. Every other tachyarrhythmia complication plus stroke. Right, so stroke, I, there's two complications. It's not really hard to tell the difference between those two. But when it starts getting complicated, literally, between when there's a lot of complications attached to it, you want to try to separate it out. Like AIDS, for instance, has all kinds of AIDS-defining illnesses. There's like 35 of them. But you know, again, we're going to narrow it down to like maybe like 10 or five for you to, to know for the test. For which the NCLEX, but once you know the most common ones, the top three, top five. But that you, that's, makes good sense to put it on a table so you can say, well, shoot, CD4 less than 200, they have this, this one. CD4 less than 100, they have this one. CD4 less than 50, they have this complication. And you put that on a table, bam, the one at the bottom was the worst one. So and that was the one that had CD4 less than 50. It gives you spatial things on the test when you're trying to, on your test, trying to memorize things. Which one was that one? Well, that was the one that was on the bottom. What was the bottom row? Then you can maybe highlight it, get different colors. It's 2024, we have color printers now, right? So you can make these things make spatial sense to you as well, okay? So complications can be a table of their own. Of course, disease processes can be one. We're doing EKGs, you can, it's the same thing. What causes this EKG rhythm? What's the treatment for this EKG rhythm? What's the complications? But also other things would be medications. Ugh. I don't like medications, right? Well, I, I, they're okay when you understand them, when you understand how they work and you understand what they're trying to fix, you're going to want to know, if we, like diabetes, for instance, has 11 to 13 different classes of medications. I should make a table, that way I know which medication is the one that causes major adverse cardiac events, which is the one that's, you know, I hold for contrast studies, which is the one that does this. So when you try to put it spatially, it can make a little more sense when it's not, so it's not, you know, a whole bunch of information in front of you. Okay, does that make sense? There you can have a table for meds, a table for disease processes, a table for diagnostic tests. Sometimes diagnostic tests can get hairy, where there's like three to four diagnostic tests for, for a disease. All right, sometimes when you're doing like a section of GI, you can just have a section, just a table of diagnostic tests, colonoscopy, and what tests are that, what, what disease processes are they for, and what are the complications of it, and what are the nursing interventions teaching I'm gonna do. You don't wanna make your table over encumbered. Rationales are great, but you're not gonna put down wash hands. Make sure the bed's in the low lock position. Those are things we know, right? You want to try to write things that are different, right? I'm going to teach them about their diet and exercise, right? That's not really what I'm going to focus on, right? I want to, if it's not, if it's not over here, then yes, I'll, I'll add it here, right? But I'm not going to teach them about the complication of DKA. I'm going to teach them about the complications of hypoglycemia. Uh, that's not something I'm going to put right over here. I might put that on my complication table. When I talk about hypoglycemia, these are things I'm going to teach them, right? I want to try to make my table not as over encumbered as possible. Okay, so meds, you can't get away from meds. Meds are about 19% of your NCLEX, so it is required. Some students are always like, can you ask less meds questions? Well, we're going to be doing you a do disservice because the NCLEX is going to ask you about medications, whether you like it or not. So. Again, a table, for example, for medications would be that you are, you know, you're separating all your antihypertensives, all your high blood pressure medications. Well, there's like five or six of them, so how do I separate them out? And once you make the table once, it's not really going to change, right? Unless a really brand new antihypertensive medication comes out, but again, it's going to be five years before they get tested on, right? So these antihypertensives have not changed, so these are the ones we're going to ask you. Beta blockers, mass centers of hypoglycemia. That's a great question to ask, right? Every antihypertensive medication, you're going to check your blood pressure ahead of time. You're going to make sure they know about orthostasis, make sure they get up slowly, make sure they drink fluids. Those are things that are every single blood pressure medication. So in, in clinic, when, you're when your instructor's asking, what are you going to do for this beta blocker? Well, I'm going to teach you about to get up slowly. I'm going to teach them so that, because that's the right answer, but like what's, they're, then if they're going to probably prompt you for more questions about what else you can ask. And that's what your table can help you with, right? Your table can help you figure out what the different side effects are and how you know the side effects. That's a whole bunch of memorization. But when you know the mechanism of action, that's what gets you to the side effect every single time because it's usually stopping a process of some sort and therefore you're going to get some side effect out of it. Okay, so the MOA, this will help you understand not only the, um, for like disease processes for the pathophys, but the MOA, the mechanism of action, will help you understand that medication and why I teach them these, th teach them these things why this is the treatment, 
and why this is side effects. Okay, so again, medications are not going to go away. And what do you have to know for medications? You have to know the class, because why do you have to know the class? Because usually they all have a ending of some sort, unless it's a monoclonal antibody, they hate us, right? You know, amaluzumab and all these different ones where it's just the, in, the initials of the guys that discovered it, right? It's not, it makes no sense whatsoever, but beta blockers, they all end in LOL. Uh, ACE inhibitors all end in PRIL. That's going to help you, mem uh, help you understand these medications. All right, we understand the class. So go oh, shoot, it's beta blocker, LOL, you know, labetalol. Okay, I'm now, I'm now in business, all right? All right, so that's medications. All right, so the physiology. So these are one of your prereqs for a reason. The reason being that it was there to make you understand how things work normally because disease processes are going to affect what's normal and you're gonna get side effects because of that. Medications are gonna affect what's normal and it's, you're gonna get side effects because of what resulted. These guys went like 20 minutes. I'm going to be like 10 minutes. Oh, have they gone? No, no, they, they, they went, but I'll finish. Already. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish like oh, no, four, 45. Fine. Okay. All right. So the physiology can help you with understanding why this process is the way it is. Why I teach them X, Y, and Z is because the disease process leads to these symptoms, leads to these complications, right? So you know, have to know how it works normally before you understand what will happen when it's broken. Right? You have to understand what something looks like. Like you're making Legos, right? You have to understand what it looks like. If you're making, doing a puzzle, well, if you're doing a puzzle, sometimes you want to you can go, go uh, and, you know, say, well, I'm going to make a puzzle. I'm not going to look at the, the box at, at all. But if you know how it works normally, you're, you're going to be able to get to the right answer every time. Okay? For instance, the RAS, the RAAS system, that's not going to leave you. The S and S is not going to leave you. That's something that's can, from physiology you're going to be using multiple, multiple times. Multiple disease processes, multiple medications all affect this renin angiotensin aldosterone system and you're going to get hyperkalemia if I block the system because this system gets rid of potassium. It's the only system that gets rid of potassium in the body. So if I give an ACE inhibitor, bam, right there, I get high potassium. If I have a disease process that blocks the system in some fashion, I'm going to get high potassium, right? That's going to be associated with it. This whole system raises my blood pressure. So if I get a medication, usually medications, antihypertensives are going to block the system in some fashion, right? So that's the idea. 90% of what you're going to do in nursing school is going to be using your physiology. And you have to know this cold. You have to be able to know this system already. We're not going to reiterate it to you in, nurse, in, in lecture. That's ex expected that you kind of know what that, that is. You might have to review it. It might set you back a few, few hours, but you got to get that information under your belt so that you can understand. Otherwise, you're going to be lost trying to figure out, well, what's this medication do? I thought, why does it cause hyperkalemia? I thought it caused hypokalemia. Well, if you understand how it worked, it blocked ACE, and it's hyperkalemia every single time. It's impossible to get hypokalemia. All right? 8% of your anatomy that you had as prereqs, that was you used 5% of it in fundamentals. The rest of it you'll use. The other 3% you might use throughout nursing school about how the heart function works, like the, the valves to the heart. You might learn about different, you know, that's not going to be what we're testing you on, but it's also not going to help you as much as physiology will. And micro, you took, and micro, you used in Messers 2. A lot of you guys came to Messers 2, micro experts. We learned antibiotics, we learned infection, right? That's really where micro came in, right? There's not much other micro beside, that we're going to be utilizing outside of that in Messers 2. All right, so again, the why behind each item. Why is this medication used? Why is this symptom uh, there? Why is this treatment there? Why is this nursing intervention something I got to teach them? Why are these things the, 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 the right answer, right? And that's what you're going to add to your, your tables, your, your study tools about why something is. If all your tables and all your constant maps all just have just you know, information, it's just memorizing. But you want to try to get to the right answer every time, right? You want to also be able to copy and paste information. So when you say, like, hypoxia is a symptom of this disease process, well, shoot, hypoxia is always hypoxia. It has not changed in 200, 300, or probably eternity. But hypoxia, since we've been able to measure certain things, hypoxia is hypoxia is hypoxia. And it's going to have symptoms of hypoxia. What is hypoxia? Well, they get cyanosis late, right? They start getting tachycardic. They start getting tachypnic. They start getting diaphoretic. And those three things was actually the SNS response. So one of the first things I teach you in message one is the SNS response, because it's going to be almost every disease process lead has SNS response attached to it. What's specific for hypoxia? We talked about cyanosis. Well, they're going to get short of breath, so I'm going to raise the head of bed, right? They're going to get, when they get short of breath and they, they're flat, but they feel better when they're upright, what's that called? 
What's the fancy word for that? Orthopnea. Kids will tripod, right? They'll actually lean all the way forward, or your COPD will lean on the, onto the bedside table, right? So that's a sign of hypoxia. They're going to have something we can measure. Their saturations will be low. Their PO2, if we do an ABG, will be low. And again, late cyanosis. So this right here, I'm just going to copy and paste. Any kind of respiratory disorder can have hypoxia. So your clinical instructor says, hey, what, if someone has asthma, what are some symptoms? Well, shoot, they're going to have late cyanosis. They're going to have, you know, you're going to, you're going to just rattle through them, right? But what's unique to the asthmatic? They're going to have wheezing and coughing. Wheezing, coughing, hypoxia. Someone has pulmonary edema, they're going to have all the hypoxia symptoms, copy and paste it, copy and paste, right? Plus what's different? They're going to have pink frothy sputum. Pink frothy sputum, crackles, plus hypoxia. So I've, I'm copy and pasting, right? I'm just learning it once the right way, and then I can then copy and paste it. And SNS response is also another thing that's always going to be an average disease process has usually SNS response is going to get fired off. So SNS response is what? Tachycardia, tachypnea, diaphoresis, pupil dilation, feeling of impending doom. That's a lot of things are going to stimulate that, right? So when a disease process like dehydration has low blood pressure, stimulates the SNS response, I'm going to have dehydration. What's unique about dehydration? I got dry, cracked mucous membranes. I got uh, sunken fontanelles, again, as an 80-year-old, I guess, right, <laughs> up to 18 months. I'm going to have these, you know, you know I'm going to feel, feel thirsty. But what's the SNS response? It's going to fire off. So I'm going to have get tachycardic, tachypneic. I'm not going to be diaphoretic because I'm, I'm out of fluid. So that's really what's only different. So allowing you to copy and paste can help a lot. Define SNS for them. SNS? What does SNS stand for? Sympathetic nervous system. That's your flight, fight or flight, right? That's where you're going to be firing off all the fibers from your brain based on different inputs. Okay. All right. So the idea is again, again, you want to try to compartmentalize. So once you learn something once, you can then copy and paste it every time. Like when you're coming from fundamentals, it was always to do the, you know, wash your hands, verify the order, explain the, the, the procedure to the patient. These are all things I'm going to copy and paste every single time. I don't have to. I'm not going to write it down in my tables or write it down in my, my, my study notes every single time. I know that's the general stuff I'm going to do, right? All right, so two slides. So memorization, again, only gets you halfway. It's not, not even all the way there. It's like when you talk about in and out, right? When someone tells you how to get to in and out, how do you describe that? Well, it's off Avenue I and 20th Street, and the, the address is 2202. What is it? Right, 2021 West Avenue Y. And is that how you describe it to someone? No, you describe how to get there. So that's the idea behind the physiology. It gets you there every single time. If you understand how it works normally, you're going to be able to get to that information every time, right? You don't want to start. You don't want to memorize all the, all the addresses for in and out. You want to try to know where it's at geographically. That's where the anatomy helps you, right? The anatomy will help you, and mnemonics will help you get to that the anatomy sometimes, like tissue paper, my assets. That will know, get you the different valves. That way you know how it works. But that was anatomy. We're not going to test you on that. We are going to test you if this valve breaks. What are the symptoms? Well, shoot, it's going to back up into the lungs. I'm going to get some pulmonary edema, which is hypoxia and SNS response and pink frothy sputum and crackles, right? So mnemonics can help a lot, but we want to be able to, again, try to get to the right answer every time. Right, up to 44% of the information we get inputted gets lost in one hour. We have to be able to get that information and assimilate it as best we can. Okay. All right. So final thoughts. All right. So technology, use it to your advantage. Right. There are several tools out there. There's AI now, which is great. It can make practice questions for you. It can make case studies for you. It can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Right. Have communal notes. So we have Google Drive now. We have other documents you all guys can write into. You can create tables all together. You, you guys do, and you can separate out from your three friends and study group. You could do this disease process, I'll do this disease process, and you over there do that disease process, and all three of you get together that night and go over all your notes, right? And you have to be a BS artist. That's one of the big, big things, again, is to be able to find the important information. Try to find what is the most important amongst all this information you're being uh, assessed. And in-class questions are a great way to get through all that. They're going to be able to identify you know, that this is important. right? You can understand all these different medications, all these things, but what is the medication that gets tested the most? What is the disease process that gets tested the most? What's the nurse intervention that gets tested the most? That's kind of what in-class questions will help, help guide you to. Okay? 
be able to skim like a boss. You want to be able to find, you know, look through your chapters, look to see what tables are there, what drawings are there, what boxes, important boxes, things that are highlighted, things that are life-threatening, things that are different, are really what are going to help you um, assess what's the most different, okay? All right, do I really need to write down every time? Again, wash hands, uh, verify the order, explain the procedure, or is that kind of implied? I know that's been ingrained and that's what I'm going to do, but what is different about this procedure? What's different about this disease process, All right? So we have the internet, really to, there's a lot of tools out there to help us, and we want to be able to share those tools as well, okay? All right, so that's all. So I'll put this recording online for you guys as well, for those that missed it. And uh, any questions on how to study in general or study from MedSurge? All good? I have a question.